to all our distinguished guests, good morning. The Vision 2030 Jamaica Secretariat at the Planning Institute of Jamaica is pleased to participate in this year's staging of the Best Practice Symposium under the theme Operationalizing Best Practices at the Policy, Program, and Community level. We sang, and for me spoke, because I can't sing, the national anthem this morning, and one of the lines, as we all know, says, give us vision lest we perish. My purpose here today is to advance a conversation about our national vision, one that we have given high priority, and that is how we can work with our stakeholders to make our Vision 2030 Jamaica, which has been recognized regionally and globally as a best practice in development planning, implementation, and monitoring and evaluation, meaningful in parish and community level development, and recognizable as having an impact on the lives of each and every Jamaican. As most, if not all, persons here are aware, Jamaica is pursuing its first long-term national development plan, Vision 2030 Jamaica, which covers the 21-year period, 2009 to 2030. The implementation of Vision 2030 Jamaica is intended to engage all partners in development at the national and local levels towards the achievement of developed country status. As embodied in the vision statement, Jamaica, the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. Hence, the four goals of Vision 2030 Jamaica represent our collective aspirations for a good life. Jamaicans are empowered to achieve their fullest potential. The Jamaican society is secure, cohesive, and just. Jamaica is a prosperous economy. Jamaica is a healthy, natural environment. But what does this really mean? And our noble chairperson asked that question. Well, first of all, it means that for us to achieve Vision 2030 Jamaica, our people must not only think, but have, but they must have an experience of Jamaica that provides equitable opportunities for achieving practical goals and hard to reach dreams. And that persons have access to social amenities, public goods and services that support happy, healthy, long, meaningful, productive, and satisfied lives. It means that development is sustainable. Where we take care of our needs today without jeopardizing the ability of future Jamaicans to achieve their development goals and build on the progress that we make. It also means that development is inclusive, that all Jamaicans in all counties, parishes, communities, and households have equal opportunities to achieve their fullest potential and know what is their fullest potential through equitable access to quality health care, clean water and sanitation, education and training, reliable and efficient transportation, food, income, and social security, including sustainable livelihoods, and access to capital for starting a little business towards achieving big business. Secure tenure, no need to squat, and affordable and adequate shelter, good quality infrastructure, including roads, sewage, electricity, and information and communications technology, including digital technology, and we're not just talking about everybody having one and two cell phones, security and justice for all. Now, how will we achieve this vision? The roadmap for achieving Vision 2030 Jamaica comprises the overarching national policy framework, what we want to achieve, and the approach we're going to take to achieving this. The National Development Plan document, which covers the approach to achieving development over the 21-year period. We have 31 sector plans, which provide details on the vision and approach to achieving development in the respective sectors, such as education, health, culture, the economy, and the environment. Now, we have our sectoral policies, agendas, and strategies, such as the growth agenda. In terms of implementation, 
we have successive three year, because that's our policy framework, so now how do we operationalize it, implement it? We have successive three year, medium term, socioeconomic policy frameworks. And that's the main implementation mechanism for Vision 2030 Jamaica, which includes priorities from the plan, that's the big plan document, our sector plans and our sectoral agendas, policies and strategies to guide us in pursuing a collective and shared path to development over three, each three year period. And this is one of the critical areas that our approach to development should be collective and shared at every level of, of, of society. Accordingly, we should align with the MTF, the strategic, corporate and operational plans of all partners in development, whether they be ministries, departments, and agencies, private sector, civil society, faith-based organizations, and NGOs, count, um, country plans of our international development partners, local sustainable development plans for the parishes, and community development plans. This means that the development plan and activities of your parish development committee, community development committee, Benevolent Society, Citizens Association, for example, is part of the national roadmap for development. If these plans are not aligned to Vision 2030 Jamaica, our development continues because we're always moving, but we wouldn't be moving in a current manner, where we all would be heading in the same direction towards the same targets. But instead, we would all be going our own way and possibly tripping over each other duplicating activities and inefficiently utilizing our scarce resources. As previously stated, Vision 2030 Jamaica has been recognized as a global and regional best practice in a number of areas. And these include its design as a model for goal-oriented, result-based development planning that integrates social, economic, and environmental development. The implementation framework that allows for continuous improvement through successive three-year medium-term socioeconomic policy frameworks, which are structured holistic and include strategic prioritization of development accelerators and catalysts towards achieving the four goals and 50 national outcomes that I hadn't mentioned earlier. And just to state that if there's something that wasn't included in the National Development Plan, that's the big 21-year document, and that was done in 2009. The medium-term socioeconomic policy framework allows us to include those areas that are emerging areas of development. And then the monitoring and evaluation framework that is outcome-driven. It's focused on progress towards our outcomes and goals. So we're not looking at outputs, we're looking at where we want to be in terms of our out outcomes. And it represents principles of transparency and accountability because the results are reported to the public and they are posted on our website. In 2016, Jamaica's National Development Planning Framework, which has Vision 2030 J Jamaica at the axis, was determined to be approximately 91% aligned to the Sustainable Development Goals, one of the highest levels of alignment globally. And since then, we have sought to address some of the gaps and anticipate that if we were to repeat the assessment, we would be much closer to 100% today. The roadmap for SDG implementation in Jamaica identifies Vision 2030 Jamaica as the, and the MTF as the most appropriate mechanism for achievement of the SDGs. And this is in fact a global best practice because what it says, we started our national development planning process in 2009 a global agenda developed, was developed in 2015 that mirrored our 2009 plan. It says that we are visionary. Therefore, under Vision 2030 Jamaica, we have a long-term plan with mechanisms in place to respond to changes in the local, national, and international arenas and a process for monitoring and measuring the results of our development actions as it relates to where we wish to be by 2030. And we're on the path to making Vision 2030 Jamaica a best practice model for local level development. But how do we achieve this? After all, we all know that for us to view development favorably, we must be able to recognize the positive changes and the creation of an enabling environment for all to achieve their fullest potential. 
For Vision 2030 Jamaica to be a best practice model for local level development, there must be a seamless alignment of parish and community level development planning with national level development planning. We must pursue the national goals and outcomes and the general approach to development on the Vision 2030 Jamaica at the parish and the community levels. And the measurement of community level development results must be so designed to allow us to understand the performance of each parish and community regarding the key areas that we have identified as a country as indicators of development. We're also required to ensure that the indicators of national development are reflective of what most Jamaicans see as important and what most affect the lives of Jamaicans. Let me wrap up with some key considerations for strengthening local level development planning and coordinating local level development processes as the concerns of each parish and the communities, districts, streets, lanes, and roads, whether it be old road or new road, can be addressed within the Vision 2030 Jamaica Plan Implementation Framework, which includes local sustainable development plans and community development plans, programs, and projects. A national development plan takes into consideration what must be done at the high level to create the enabling environment for development at the local level. So local sustainable development plans and community plans in turn speak to the realities in individual parishes and communities, whether they're high, middle, or low income. So for example, we are strengthening our national school curriculum to meet the different needs of students. And it is critical to ensuring that all students, regardless of where they reside, whether it's urban, poor, and whether their parents are rich or poor, or whether they themselves as adult students are rich or poor, have the same access to good quality education. So educational policy cannot come from communities or parishes. They have to come from the national level. However, within communities, we then have to tailor these national policies to meet our own needs. And it is this intersection where our local actions are linked to national policy where we are implementing Vision 2030 Jamaica. Okay, for Vision 2030 Jamaica to be recognized as a best practice in terms of its operationalization as well. It therefore means we have to strengthen our institutional arrangements, structures and systems, and our processes for coordinating and alignment. And at this point, we're on the path. We do see replicable models, and we do see the promise of where we can, maybe in a year or two, I think, in our, at our next um, best practice symposium, say yes, we are so highly aligned that we know that we have best practice models for that level of alignment. We have in place mechanisms such as the Community Renewal Program, which seeks to operationalize Vision 2030 Jamaica at the local level. Agencies such as the Social Development Commission and the Jamaica Social Investment Fund, as well as initiatives such as the Citizen Security and Justice Program, implement programs at the local level and conduct research to inform community profiles and undertake necessary monitoring and evaluation of program impact on local level development. Efforts at coordination of local level development action through the Social Development Commission, in Commission's interagency network, and the development of indicators for community renewal and community readiness for development intervention by the CRP are among the institutional tenets of the Vision 2030 Jamaica plan implementation process that seek to budding best practices. Our municipal corporations have been aligning parish level development planning with Vision 2030 Jamaica and many have expressed interest in furthering collaboration with the Secretariat to strengthen alignment. And in our medium term socioeconomic policy framework 2018 to 2021, we do have a number of strategic actions addressing this area. Let me hurry up in one minute. As we move forward, we hope to strengthen collaboration with our local level development partners to empower and enable our Jamaican people to effect the changes we want and transform our beloved island into a developed country that benefits everyone. Let us work together to make Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business for every Jamaican in every parish, every community, every district, street, lane, every complex or yard, every home. Vision 2030 Jamaica, advancing the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, 
leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pisha Brand. I love how you got everything in in that last minute there. <laughs> I'm a huge fan. Personally, I'm a huge fan of Vision 2030, Jamaica, the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. I think that in the same way you see people lining up to go and live in various countries, people should be lining up to come and live here because it's just so awesome to come and live in Jamaica. Can anybody else, yeah? Thank you, I'm not imagining this, I'm not crazy. Thank you, I really think so. And I am looking forward to hearing from our panelists for session two. Session two is entitled Parenting and the Family. And as you all know, the family is the smallest building block of society. And when you think about, just think about a building made up of multiple building blocks, if those blocks are good, high quality blocks, then the building, provided the drawing and the design and so on is good, the building should be a strong building. But what if the blocks are defective? What if the blocks didn't pass the Bureau of Standards test and all these things, and you're living in that house? You could have some issues, just saying. So when people, Sometimes I think we see family and children and all those things as not really getting to the heart of what you really need for national development. Those are just kind of on the, the fringes of what's really important. But if you look at it, that's at the heart of what's really important. Family and parenting. And I'm going to invite the moderator, Ms. Casey Carr, Chief Executive Officer of the National Parenting Support Commission, MPSC, to come up and to introduce to us her panel that will be discussing parenting and family. Please make her welcome. Masters of Ceremonies, Ms. Mrs. Williams and Mr. Burbick, uh, Mr. Rupert Price, Acting Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Local Government and Community Development, Mr. Rohan Richards, Chief Technical Director, Security Policy Risk Management Affairs Division in the Ministry of National Security, Mr. Orville Simmons, CSJP, uh, Dr. Winter, National Housing Trust, Mr. Emmanuel De Rosa, the Jamaica Public Service Company Limited, Mr. Omar Firth, Frick, SBC, other important representatives from USAID, European Union, World Bank, ID, IADB, DFID, Mr. David Allen, Chairman, Fletcher's Land Management. Benevolent Society, Father Powell from All Angels, All Angel, All Saints Anglican Church, community residents, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce the panel of esteemed persons to you this morning as we delve into the whole matter of parenting. I have to my immediate left, Mr. Andre Miller, who is the national coordinator for the parenting program aligned to the Ministry, of the Ministry of Labor and Social Security and the Ministry of Education, Youth and, Impl and Information. The implementing agency for that project is the National Parenting Support Commission. To his left, I have Ms. Winnie Berry, who is the Deputy Chief Education Officer acting in the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, representing the Honorable Ruel Reed, Minister, Minister of Education, Youth and Information. And then there's Dr. Melva Spence from the Citizen Security and Justice Program. You know, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think it is agreeable that families or healthy families form the bedrock of society. That's a statement we hear all the time. However, we know that key to that health of the family is parenting. I am happy to be alive and to be serving in this capacity at a time 
when our policymakers have recognized that parenting is indeed a technical skill and a discipline in its own right. And if we are going to recognize Vision 2030, as Pisha spoke about earlier, then we also have to ensure that our families are functioning in a way that we can have societies that we can all be proud of. As a ministry, Ministry of Education that is, we have long bemoaned the fact that interventions that we put in schools, interventions that we try throughout all the, the different stages, they sometimes do not work and that is because of the missing component. Now, we have recognized that that missing component was always the key stakeholders, parents. If we don't have parents on board, then almost everything that we do becomes counterproductive. And so, we're operating as the National Parenting Support Commission under this huge conglomerate called the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, aligning, <laughs> aligning our work in communities with parents to the overarching policies for our Ministry of Education and, by extension, the vision of Jamaica. I won't say anything more because I want to leave the floor to the persons who are going to present, but just say I'm actually excited to hear the presentations and of course, after each person would have presented, we're going to have a panel discussion where you two will get to ask each panelist questions. So may I welcome first Mr. Andre Miller. Well, let, let me refer to the program. <laughs> May I welcome first, as the protocol dictates, Ms. Winnie Berry, who is representing the Minister of Education, Youth and Information. And thank you, colleague and moderator, Ms. Casey Carr, CEO of the National Planning Support Commission, Parenting Commission. And so, Master of Ceremonies, Miss Audrey Wilson, distinguished guest and collaborating ministries, it is indeed my pleasure to bring you greetings on behalf of the Ministry of Education, but also to say to you at this time that the Minister had a conflict with schedule and could not be here. But he has sent you quite a message. He has shared with you our policy and general overview of our concept of what's happening in our families and communities. And let me note also my colleagues present, Mr. Andre Miller from the um, National Parenting Commission, Commission um, Support Commission, and he's coordinator of the PATH project. Let me note also from CSJP, Miss Melva Spence. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Often we assume that good parenting comes naturally and that it has the major role in shaping children's outlook and behavior. The reality is that the life which we face is really much more complex than that. Studies done over years in various fields of academia, including sociology and psychology, have established that there's an important link between an individual's environment and his emotional and physical health. This has led to many programs targeting improved health by improving the physical and social environment of a community. There's also a recognition that an individual's social relationships can also have a profound impact on the quality of parenting, which in turn affects a child's health, development, and future achievements. 
as we look at our theme of parenting and family as part of the best practices for community development, we recognize that there are many factors which will have an impact on the quality of family life and consequently on the wider society. As we look at our theme, we must consider a number of issues. These include, but are not limited to, steady employment, edu education, income, financial stability, housing, and external social environment. The type and quality of education available to children and parents directly affect the family. The opportunity for early education and availability of high quality childcare also gives children an important head start in life and helps them to learn to think and develop an appreciation for learning. The availability and the type of housing influences also modern family life. Unstable housing also leads to poor school attendance, low grades, and increases in chronic family health conditions. The types of employment available in the community and the salaries for work affect family dynamics. In many societies, including Jamaica's, we see that where there is a lack of jobs available for families in low income areas, that some family members see crime and drug dealing as legitimate sources of income. This sometimes leads children in their families to view crime as acceptable employment, and this creates cycles of legitimate activity. Of course, this behavior is not peculiar to low-income areas, as some affluent people are also involved in illegal activities. And so questions of personal values take on a greater importance in our discussion of parenting and social development. There are other dynamics as well. We're familiar with the extended family examples where grandmothers, aunts, and uncles played influential roles in the raising of children. With increased mobility, though, and migration and a breakdown in the broad sense of community, families have become more insular. And so the cohesiveness that helped to keep families and communities together is diminishing. Where the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information have recognized that families need help to navigate the challenges of children in a healthy environment. And so, through our National Parenting Support Commission, we are committed to providing parents with the necessary training and support to raise their children as a first line of defense against crime. I contend that the more we think about it, the more we'll have to appreciate that there's almost an equal burden or responsibility between and among ministries, including the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, along with labor and social security and health that is really going to arrest the crime problem in Jamaica. It is not the responsibility of the Ministry of National Security alone. And we at Education, we are committed through agencies such as our NPSC, 
or National Parenting Support Commission to be engaged in targeted education to ensure, to enable behavior change. Responsibility must rest with parents too. So we are recognizing that responsible and effective parenting can help in avoiding future delinquency. Jamaica's battle with crime and violence is due in large measure to the breakdown of families. And collectively, we have to support families to do a better job of parenting. Earlier this year, we launched the Brain Builders Program, a strategy for the first 1,000 days of a child's life. The simple premise is that the earliest stimulation sets the foundation for everything else that will follow, including cognitive development and wholesome social interaction. This strategy This strategy was developed based on an analysis of the strengths and challenges of the current early childhood development program in Jamaica. It is recognized that there are services that all children need. These include high quality and responsive parenting based on a knowledge of child development, parenting, education, and support to ensure parents understand the importance of parenting on brain development, and preventative and curative health care and anticipatory guidance, good nutrition, early stimulation and early learning opportunities and protection from violence, abuse, and neglect in all forms. The main objective of this policy, the main objective of this strategy is to ensure that all Jamaican children get the best start in life in the first 1,000 days by attending to their health, nutrition, development, stimulation, social protection, child protection, and early intervention needs. Among the strategic objectives to accomplish this main objective are to increase public education and support for the first 1,000 days. And this we're speaking to our zero to two population. Development of a comprehensive national program for children zero to two years and their families. This requires collaborative memoranda of understanding between the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, Ministry of Health, and Ministry of Labor and Social Security, as well as the Ministry of Finance. The plan is to establish brain builder centers in every constituency across the island to offer additional support to parents. Community development does not take place in a vacuum. Ladies and gentlemen, neither does good parenting. There are many moving parts, but the more we work together, collectively, the better we will be able to address the many social concerns that confront us and which have a negative impact on family life. We're a team. Together, everyone achieves more. I thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Berry. And we're moving right along in the interest of time because I'm sure we want to get to the panel discussion where you can participate. So may I now introduce Mr. Andre Miller. Thank you very much, moderator. Having established all protocols, I say good morning. I trust you're all feeling well this morning as we come to have this conversation on the best practices. Um, I know in Jamaica we're used to a monologic situation, but I want to present to you a dialogue this morning for us to have a conversation. And so as I articulate some of the critical components of what the National Parent Support Commission has been able to do, I do hope you'll make copious notes and we can have a fulsome conversation. I'll be taking us through the discourse shifting from policy to practice, and as was enunciated in the minister's presentation, there are several pieces of legislation that has guided the establishment of regulation and, and a framework for empowering the family, specifically parents. The National Parenting Support Commission is an agency of the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information. In fact, it is governed by two key pieces of legislation. That is the National Parenting Policy of 2011, which received bipartisan support, and the establishment of the National Parenting Support Commission Act in 2012, and thereafter, the National Parenting Support Commission as a secretariat was established, operating out of our Canewood complex here in Kingston, but nonetheless having tentacles across the island. There are other critical and pertinent pieces of legislation that supports the Parenting Commission as it executes its mandate, chief among which is the Child Care and Protection Act. In fact, many parents are astonished when we tell them that children have a duty of care to ensure that their parents in their latter years are cared for. And so the government in its, in its thinking was comprehensive. And as such, the National Parent Support Commission is mandated, colleagues, to provide parenting education and the support services to all categories of parents. Under the NPSC's mandate, it has been able to operationalize legislation via the establishment of an effective parenting intervention framework. Now, under this framework, the commission has been able to establish some 10 critical programs. And today, however, we will hone in, we will zone in on one of those key programs, and that is the parent mentorship training program. But just to say a little bit about some of our programs, all programs take policy into the streets, and it seeks to shore up parents in their duty of care, as well as to ensure that wherever there are gaps in their knowledge, we seek to provide that level of support. And so we work, as I'll say a little later, we work within the home, the school, and the community. So we'll focus on the parent mentorship training program, which is our flagship program. But just to uh, give you a little bit of understanding, our Street Talk to Real Talk program takes the commission into communities doing one-day intervention, just ensuring that this whole concept of parenting becomes a real conversation. In fact, our research has shown us that many parents have often opted out of, be, of being parents um, because of just the stressors of, of parenting that comes on us. And I'm sure many of us in this room can testify of those moments that we want to just suspend being a parent for a moment or two, and then we tap back in when graduation time come and put on the nice clothes, not true? Yes, man. And so we, we want to ensure that parents appreciate the conversation and, and they're fully equipped to do this job of parenting. It's, it's quite a skill set. And so we're going to talk some more about our parent mentorship training program, which is what I'll focus on this morning. So under our effective, you can move to the next slide, under our effective uh, parenting um, intervention framework, the parent mentor education training program really has some three key elements. It seeks to support parents at the community level, as I said earlier. It seeks to ensure that families um, who, who require assistance based upon uh, an assessment of them being at risk receive the necessary support, as well as it provides a broad framework for something we call effective parenting. So we don't use the terminology called bad parents. We say ineffective parenting and effective parenting. 
And so under that effective parenting framework, we have some four elements that guide the conversation. We believe that all parents must nurture their children. We believe that all parents ought to provide structure so their children ought to have a bedtime and a study time and a time for play. So this conversation about picnic play too much is something that we're seeking to debunk. We want children to play. Once you're under 18, you must be playing. And playing, of course, you can infuse in that process learning. And so our friends in the Early Childhood Commission will back up this statement because we're pushing the discourse around play and the UNICEF, I believe. And then we also push in the conversation this element of recognition. We want parents to not only award their, reward their children when it comes to graduation, but for every incremental achievement that they make in school or in their behavior, recognize that achievement. And finally, we want parents to empower their children, similar to how Usain Bolt's father empowered him, and now he can do anything he wants to do because his father guided him into the best field possible. Nonetheless, our mentorship training program, which commenced some three, four years ago, is undergirded by theoretical uh, perspectives. Uh, we, we are guided by three key theories. The theory of the task-centered approach to parenting. We also undergird our discourse around the theory of human development, recognizing that every individual falls at a different stage in their developmental uh, cycle. And so we don't apply a broad brush approach in our discourse um, um, with parents. And then we also integrate the whole concept of behavior change or behavior modification. Again, recognizing that for many human beings, they may find themselves wherever in the stages of change theory, pre-contemplation, contemplation, or they may have changed their behavior, but because of some fiscal shock or economic or, or social shock, they may have relapsed. And as such, we try to undergird our conversation. But there are some assumptions that these theories help us to make so we don't broad brush, we don't have a broad brush uh, approach to, to, to empowering parents. Among the assumptions that we make is that one short-term psychodynamic model is important to ensure that the intervention is effective. Secondly, we want to ensure that, we want to remember that people have the innate abilities to change. And so we don't make, we don't make the assumption that they can't. They have that, 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 that ability and the desire to solve their own problems. Thirdly, we recognize that there is an ecological environment in which problems will occur. And so a child that is acting out is not acting out in isolation of. They're acting out because there are variables contributing, whether it be violence in their community, whether it be uh, parents not being able to understand the key tenets of their, of their job description, as well as we recognize that people have the, the capacity to solve their problems. And so we enter communities via our parent mentorship training program with these key assumptions, short-term um, intervention, people have the capacity to solve their problems. We want to ensure that we, we take into consideration the environment that parents um, have, to, have to operate within. And then we also recognize that people know what is best for them. If you ask a child what they want to do, they will be able to tell you. So there are some core objectives that guide us as we execute this best practice of a program. And among these four core objectives include this whole notion of expanding parental skills. Uh, there is always the popular phrase that parenting didn't come with a manual. Well, I'm happy to announce, and the CEO will back me up, that the Parenting Commission has developed a manual, and so all parents can contact the commission for that manual. You now have something in hand. You know, one clap for that one day. <laughs> we also recognize that there is need to improve parental attitudes, their knowledge, and the practices in relation to this whole matter of parenting. The truth is, there are many parents, and there are, some of us in this room may agree with this statement. When our children were born, we were not necessarily prepared for everything that was to come. We were happy, we were ecstatic for many fathers, them dancing in the living room when they married their wife pregnant. But the truth is, come 10 years later, you're looking up to the skies and saying, Lord, help, help. And so we have been able to, through this, this mentorship training program, target parents from all categories of, of socioeconomic background, empowering them. And then finally, it also seeks to 
ensure that whatever we, we present as a best practice to a family, they can model that behavior. So we don't go in there and say, don't beat your children alone. We show them what are some of the alternate approaches that you can take in, this, in, in, in parenting. So we seek to model ideal behaviors. Our approach is, is, is sort of three-pronged, if you will, but it, at the center of it, and you can go to the next slide, at the center of it, next one, is a strength-focused approach. And so we recognize that, one, we have to consider the influence of values and culture. So we, we don't go into a community or a home um, approaching it the same way we did our previous community. So the value systems in Cherry Gardens is different from the value systems in Arnett Gardens. And not to say that one is better than the other, but recognizing that the normative beliefs and the folklores and patterns are quite different. And then we also recognize that we ought to provide holistic intervention that places the family at the center of the intervention. Strategically, we work at four levels. One, the home, school, community, as well as with the, our, se our sector partners. And we have over 29 parenting sector partners operating across Jamaica. And so as a commission, we have certain anticipated outcomes as we operationalize our, our legislation. One, we want to ensure that we engender an environment that promotes care and protection via our parent places, and we want to establish parent places in every community. We want to also ensure that we engender this, this practice via our parent clubs. And then finally, we want to ensure that every parent in this room attends their PTA meetings. And some will argue, I'm at PIOJ Symposium, I can't go to PTA meeting. And then we also want to ensure that, there is, that we build the resilience of, of key parenting, uh, in key parenting domains um, to, so that parents, whether they experience intended or unintended shocks, they're able to bounce back. Um, we recognize that with the economic situation in uh, countries, it impacts Jamaica. America sneezes, we catch a cold. We want parents in Jamaica to be resilient enough that if something happens within their family, the death of a breadwinner, um, um, loss of income, whatever it is, they still can stand. And, and I want to state that for many families, once a, a, a breadwinner dies, the family has often, has often died. And so we have stepped in to support families in that respect. We have a client care and management model with our mentors. So our mentors go into the communities, parents volunteer to, to, to be engaged by our mentors, as well as our mentors are aligned to an NPSC social worker, a trained counselor, a trained social worker, who then ensures that goals are established and timelines set. We meet with the families at least two hours per week um, based upon a, on, a, on a prescribed and approved action plan. We also ensure that the intervention period does not go over six months as best as possible. And where, where there is need for further in-depth um, in intervention, that's where our referrals program kicks in um, to support parents further thereafter. So among some of our achievements, as I give you a synopsis of the program, you'd have to come to the commission so we can give you the great details of this program. But among some of our, our before I go to that, our mentors receive training in some, some 10 core models um, over about 130 hours, over a 13-week period. And we ensure that, and our mentors are volunteers, just like the average Jamaican, you can join the mentorship training program. We train you, we ensure that you are fully prepared to, 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 to empower families and support families. And we also provide retooling um, on a continuous basis. So our mentors are not left out into the cold, but we ensure that we recertify them on a regular basis. So some of the achievements of the program include, we've, we've now in our, we're now in our fourth year in implementing this program. We have been able to train over 102 Jamaicans, volunteers, they're not paid to take on this program. And, and we feel real heartened by our successes in this area because we know the realities of the Jamaican household, always busy. We have been able to implement the program in St. Thomas, Kingston, St. Andrew, and St. Catherine. I'm gonna pause to ask our parent mentors to stand. They're here with us this morning. And these are the tentacles of the commission. Just stand parent mentors, please. These are just some of our mentors.
They are the true change agents. We just sit and look good. We just sit and look good, but thank you so much. And then we have been able to, this is my signal to come down. We're, we're moving ahead and we're going to be training some 60 persons within St. Anne and Hanover. We're, we've been able to target and be involved in six, over 600 communities. And I must not leave but um, to say that we have been able to train over 2,000 parents and improve their skills in effective parenting, family management, training and life, and life skills. And so we are truly happy with our achievements. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller, for that thorough presentation. I will now ask Dr. Melva Spence to come to the lectern to share with you about the, the Citizen Security and Justice Program, the parenting program under that major program. Welcome, Dr. Spence. Thank you, Casey. And uh, to Andre, I just want to say that at this time, I can confer on you that honorary doctorate <laughs> degree in parenting. We were having that discussion this morning. Yes, um, I like the, the way how you sh share with everyone about the theory and the theoretical base, because that is key and very, very key. Um, so, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This morning, on behalf of CSJP, I consider it a honor to share with you our program that we are presently undertaking in the communities. Now, as you know, that within the CSJP communities, we have many parents, and these parents are faced with social and economical challenges. And so what we find is that there are some challenge in being effective in their parenting strategies. Because of the high level of stress that they experience, we find that the common way of disciplining their children is to use what we like to call the coercive approach. And when we talk about the coercive approach, we are talking about the shaming, the name calling, using your power to make sure that children do what you want them to do. Studies conducted in Jamaica has confirmed that corporal punishment is really and truly one of the strategy that is widely used. And so, in 2008, the CSJP implemented a parenting program in St. James that sought to capacitate parents by improving their knowledge and skills in, enga in engaging their children appropriately in order to reduce the poor parental practices that are being used. Now, CSJP's mandate is to work in 50 communities, volatile communities in Jamaica. And our overall objective in the parenting program is to nurture in parents the capacity to, to engage in effective parenting strategies without using coercion. And the intervention, when it started in 2008, we sought to improve their knowledge, their attitudes, and their skills and also to help them to resolve some of the conflicts that they have, because that is also one of our mandate. Now to achieve this, what we did, we sought to reduce the incidences of corporal punishment by parents as a disciplinary strategy in order to get the effective change that they need. And so, after consultation with communities, we realized that there were a number of challenges, even if we tried to implement a program. And one of the challenges that we heard about was getting the parents to us. It would be a cost to them, and it would also be a challenge 
as it relates to having someone to take care of their children while they are at this training. And so we decided that what would be best is to train a number of persons who we called community parent trainers and to make sure that these persons come from the community that they will be engaged in to assist these parents in the desired goals. One of our objective at the time is to promote positive communication as a tool for structure and nurturance in raising children. Specifically, the intervention sought to improve parenting skills and knowledge in the areas of mutual respect, consistency and clarity, applying natural and logical consequences, open communication, and behavior modification. One of the complaints that we were getting before the implementation of the program is that parents don't listen to us. Those were the complaints of the children. And the parents would complain that children don't listen to us. And so we realized there was a disconnect, and so we need to assist in getting that done. And so the emphasis of the program was, and still is, to train parent educators, CPTs, from the communities that we presently served. And these recruited CPTs were then engaged in an intensive 60-hour period of instruction where we fit them to be community parent trainers. The lessons after the training are then delivered to the parents in their homes. And the CPTs would at the time visit the homes two times per week. They still do that presently with the new initiative that we are engaging in. It is observed that this method has persuaded parents to listen and develop relationships with their children as the entire family is encouraged to be a part of the training. The basic requirement for being a parent trainer is not a PhD or a master's or even a bachelor's. All you need to do is to be highly respected in your community and you can read. You can understand the material and you can impart it. And so an incentive to get the parent trainers and the parents to be involved is to make sure that everyone gets a certification at the end. Now, I just want to share with you, this is some of the demographic data from 20, 2008. At the time, we like to call this our pilot program because at the time we were really and truly experimenting. And so if you notice there, we had more females than males in the program. And if you also notice, the age group that was engaged, the, it, it was made up chiefly of persons 30 to 39 years old. Moving on, also the education level of most of the participants at the time, 68 year, um, was secondary education, 61%, and the number of children in the household on average was about um, one to two at the time. Now, given the successful testimonies of the St. James intervention, the program has now been extended across 30 communities in eight parishes. And in, two, in 2017, using the same methodology, an impact evaluation has been developed. Based on the data that was collected last year, 2017, about June, July, somewhere there, we find that um, this is just the first glimmer of the data as we try to look at it and to break it apart. 35 of the parents saying that they spank, so we know that the coercive behavior is there. But over 45% of the children 
say that they are spanked. So two instruments were used to gather the data, and one with the parents and one with the children. Over 60% of the parents admitted that they shout and get angry for misbehaving, and over 50% of the children agree with them. 50% said that they reward for good behavior, and 60% of the children agree with them. So we can say something good is going on in the homes. Over 80% said that they praise their children for good behavior, and 70% of the children agree. So from the data that we collected in 2008, while the program cannot claim categorically that the intervention was totally responsible for changes, the testimonies that we got at the time were overwhelming, and I believe that's the reason why the partners decided that they want to do an impact evaluation of the program. So there were changes in mutual respect, consistency and clarity, how they apply consequences, open communication, behavior modification as an alternative, and also the parenting skills improved along with their knowledge and, their, and appropriate behavior. In 2017, in-home training was conducted in July up to this time. We are presently collecting the second set of data from the first cohort of 166 parents that were interviewed. The program presently awaits the second survey that is now under um, undertaking. It, it is continuing at this time. And in 2019, we also expect a third survey to be done in order to see what the changes are on a more long-term level. Now, we all know that we need to look at sustainability of programs. Most persons spoke about that this morning, that sure enough, we have the programs, we do the implementation, but when we leave, the program leaves with us and nothing is maintained in the community. A second cohort is presently being engaged so that we can have stronger data, and also the program is being joined. Everything that we will be doing at the dawn of, at the sunset of CSJP will be turned over to the National Parenting Support Commission, who has the mandate to carry out all parenting intervention in this country. So we know that there will be some sustainability for the program. Best practices, why we are here. What is it that we can say about the program? Collaboration with other professional agencies. At the time, in 2008, we did not do it alone. We work with the Ministry of Health. We work with NGOs. We work with a parenting NGO in Montego Bay. We also work with... Um, many other of the ministries and departments in conducting the training along with um, churches who were there also to assist us. So what have we learned? We learned that collaboration is necessary. We learned that there are strong human resources in communities that we can draw on. And I can tell you the same persons who stood for Mr. Miller, if I ask my CVTs to stand, the same will be stand, Nicole and her company around there. So we know that there are resources in the community who are willing to work. And so all we have to do is pull on them. Conducting training in the homes is very beneficial. As a social worker, I can tell you that what I have found out is that when you go in the home, the practices, you can do them immediately. It's not something that you will do in an office and send the parents home to practice. You can do the role play right there in the homes. Other family members benefit because the children can be a part of the session. They, what we found out also 
in Montego Bay that a number of the communities, the parents got together and they started their own support groups. And some of them have been going on until now. In Mount Salem especially, I can speak about that one. There, there were no need for traveling expenses or sitters for the small children. And so the parent can practice immediately the skill that was learned. So in concluding, the social problem of poor parenting practices has been with us for a long time. And all indications is that if we don't do something about it, it's going to go on. And so the transfer of this dysfunctional parenting practices has to be tackled on many fronts. But the most central front is targeting, educating, and training vulnerable parents. We suggest that the model used by CSJP is a best practice. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. I am sure you got so much from the three presentations that you heard this morning. We have a lot to talk about, so much to mull on. So for this particular section, I just want to reiterate some of the things I heard and some common threads based on the three presentations. We heard things like personal values and values and culture. We heard about sustainability, and we certainly heard very definitively, or it might have been implied, the importance of collaboration. We also talked or heard about behavior change and the fact that persons inherently have the capacity to change. We also heard about parents opting out, not wanting the responsibility of parenting. We heard about the importance of the elements of effective parenting, empowerment and structure and nurturance and also recognition. And we heard about building resilience and the importance of just understanding why you need to brace yourselves for life's challenges. And I think of import is the fact that the train, the trainer model was the one that was communicated best right across the three presentations. That when you build the capacity of persons to in turn train other persons, that's the best way to do it. Because there's no agency that has all the resources necessary to do the work. And so we also heard about the importance of volunteerism. So the parent mentors, the community parent trainers are actually all volunteers. They're not paid to do the job. And they go out having received training, both uh, in the 10 modules we offer and in the module on co coercive parenting, that they now go into the communities and they offer support to parents. What a beautiful concept. And we also heard about respectability and the fact that as we look to model behaviors for parents and we look to support, we also must choose those persons who are of unquestionable probity. We must ensure that the persons who are going out there as our tentacles are persons who can stand up to scrutiny. So we heard the importance of that. So I want to kick this off by asking the panelists, because I know as an educator, we know how to Miss Berry, you might like this one, but we know, we know how to, well, let me speak from a personal standpoint, having been a principal and so on. We know how to manipulate data. Um, many times back in the time of GSAT, you'd heard what you heard, 100% pass in GSAT. And your check is one pitney who sat the exam, right? So we know how to manipulate, but we want to talk in a very real way about the impact the, on the ground, what's really happening. So perhaps what I would want to hear from the panelists is to give me specific examples of behavior change because that came out very strongly, that having trained these trainers to go back and support other parents, that we have instances where we're seeing persons change their behaviors in the communities. So we'll just start with, with um, Mr. Miller. Uh, Ms. Berry, yours is going to be a policy question, and then I'll jump to Dr. Spence, and then I'll come to a policy question. Thank you. Well, to use an example, uh, we did a survey. Can you hear me? Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, we did a survey uh, in 2016 where we found that many of the parents were uh, taking on authoritarian parenting styles. So it's either my way or the highway. 
we found that thereafter the intervention, we saw a reduction in the number of parents who would uh, <laughs> cause their children to go under duress, if you will. So, you know, is, is either you do it my way or you leave my house. So we found parents now shifting their style to being more authoritative, um, you know, recognizing that they, they ought to take responsibility, but there is need for them to appreciate their children have rights, and that um, forcing a child to do something is not the best way to do it, but rather encouraging and teaching that child to do it is the best way. So we saw it moving from 68% to a within, within the region of about 30%. So we through our parent mentors, we saw incremental adjustments in behavior. Thank you. Dr. So she's just showing you the evidence, you know, Dr. Spence doesn't want you to question anything. So how best to convince you than showing you a parent herself whose life has perhaps been transformed. Is that what we're about to see? Okay. And I think I was at the graduation for the uh, community parent trainers when I actually met this young lady. It has such a powerful story. If I recall, she was a valedictorian, was she? Right. And so um, she, she really compelled us to listen to her story of how the program actually changed her and just helped to foster the relationship between her and her child. So um, we're waiting. No, it's not right. But take it from me because I saw it. And um, she was very emotional too, having gone through the program, how it really did help her, not only in her own parenting, but how she has now managed to use the training to actually impact others in the community. So, uh, Ms. Berry, what uh, policies do we have as a Ministry of Education that align directly now to this work that we're doing in the community? Is there any, any policy that directly aligns to it? Yes. The ministry has recognized, <coughs> as I said before, the importance of involvement from this level for behavior change. We referred earlier to the brain builders, the zero to three strategy, zero to two strategy. And we also speak to the K to 13 strategy, which speaks really to being involved from a very, very early stage in children's development. We would have known that we have hundreds of nurseries all around Jamaica that are run by private practitioners. The ministry has moved to introduce a policy to ensure that there is a regulation of these nurseries. Of course, we have been partnering with a number of them to ensure that they meet certain standards. There are certain criteria for operation. And if they come on board with us, and a number of them have already done so, we have moved to provide support for a caregiver and someone who is trained to offer the necessary psychological, social, and emotional, and educational support that these students need. Over the years also, we have introduced a number of programs which are quite in line with behavior change. We speak of the SWPBIS program, or school-wide positive behavior intervention program, and or positive behavior intervention strategy also at different levels. We have found that where there is a, a collaboration of school and a holistic approach to learning, which involves parent intervention, parent interaction, that there is an improvement in performance. We have for a number of years advocated learning communities, which involve 
or teach or, or parents actually being a part of the teaching and learning environment. They participate in homework programs. And while this may not be standardized right across our schools, there are some active school communities that continue to practice and we continue to promote through policy or learning communities, which means that parents are learners too. Not, our teachers are learners. We are all learners. And as parents learn, they enable and empower their children. There is a definite, based on what we have seen, a definite correlation between parent involvement as learners and students' behavior and performance, general improvement of performance. Thank you, Ms. Ferry. As we talk about things that correlate, there is a direct correlation too between coercive parents, parenting, sorry, and the violence that we're seeing in society. I want to open the floor a bit for you to ask questions of the panelists. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. So if there's anyone with a burning question, you could just pose your question now. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marlene Lamont, project manager with the EU delegation. I'm very project interested manager with the, with EU, the EU delegation. delegation. Yes. I would just like to get a sense of what has been the experience with adolescent parents, and to what extent would you say, um, Ms. Berry, is this addressed in the policy framework? Uh, this has been addressed quite a bit. I know that you would have heard earlier about our reintegration policies. Um, and certainly we, we seek to ensure that parents who are adolescents continue their education with the requisite support. And support that is not just educational, but psychological and emotional. And we have been reaping a number of successes from uh, um, that reintegration policy. I know that um, my colleagues would be able to support that, um, that finding that indeed a number of our adolescents have been reintegrated into our education system based on that policy and that they have done well. We have a number of testimonials, which I'm sure they could share with you. They have moved on to become well integrated into the corporate world and in other spheres of our society as productive citizens. Thank you. Mr. Just, Miller, you want just, to just want to add to that. Um, under the commission, we have a program called Parenting with a Purpose and it targets parents, adolescent parents, um, and it seeks to, again, reintegrate them um, into, the, into the formal education system, um, just giving them life skills. So we partner with JFLL, Heart Trust NTA, um, and other in institutions to ensure that parents who may have, because of their uh, early entrance into parenting, they may have suspended their own education, we try to ensure that they can achieve their goals that they had set for themselves in their formative years, in their, for, in their, in their years in, 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 this, in the secondary sector um, of education. So we were able to train some 2,400 parents over the last two years um, via, again, via our parent places and our parent clubs. So in the community, we brought the sector partners into the community space and we would have engaged the parents at all levels, recognizing that having done an aptitude test um, that we would need to customize a program for them. So we have been making some inroads in that respect. Thank you, Mr. Miller. We have just a minute to go, unfortunately. There's a gentleman with his hand at the back there. Hello. Hi. Are you hearing me? Yes, very clearly, okay. sir. Um, John Earl Spence with Fight for Peace, lead psychologist. Um, with regards to best practices, um, how, of, how much of this data is collected and shared and how widespread is the knowledge of these programs? Because uh, touching on what was brought up before is uh, how tying it in with the provision of um, social services. Um, where is your t pool of parents coming from? Because you find that you have a, I have found that you have a lot of parents out there who are one, unaware of your programs, two, um, they they they're collecting paths or some other social service, but there's no um, 
psychosocial component added on to the provision of social services. And these are the parents that are in most, I find most in need of, you know, training and proper parenting practices. So it's, so my, my point is threefold. One, awareness. We, uh, we're not seeing that in the community. Um, two, um, we're not, where, uh, the, where are we targeting the type of parents we're targeting? Because even in the case of teenage moms, um, what about the dads, the identified dads? Are they, the programs are there for keeping the teenage mother in a mainstream? Sir, what about the dads? I wonder if we, we need to have a conversation over. I'm gonna stop you so I can answer. I think since I'm responsible for setting the strategic direction of the NPSC, I'll answer that very quickly. The NPSC is only five years old, and so we are now at a point where we are looking at all our programs to do some kind of evaluation to see whether or not we're just being prejudiced about our own um, impact or whether or not we really are seeing changes. You talked about psychosocial support. It's something that we offer as well um, at the commission. In fact, it's a major part of what we do. And then you also talked about building awareness. One of the things I, I decided as I came in, and I've only been CEO for a year and a half with the commission now, is that I wanted to take the programs outside of Eastern Jamaica, where we have done very well, in my opinion. And so that is the reason now, for example, the parent mentorship program, we just finished training parent mentors in Montego Bay. We started in Hanover. We start next week in Oterius. So we'll have two cohorts going simultaneously. And we have been working very purposefully in Westmoreland and in St. Elizabeth. So we are trying to cascade the programs across Jamaica, understanding as a country girl that Kingston is not Jamaica. So we'll have further discussions. I want to thank you so much. And there was a hand. I will come to you, and we will speak later. Thank you so much. Our time is up. Yes. Right, and I did thank you, Dr. Spence, and I did talk about the past parenting program that Andre heads, and we have a lot of data because that program is on its final stages now. We have a lot of data where that is concerned, but like I said before, we'll be looking at all our programs, and we're at a point now, having started five years ago, to do comprehensive evaluations. That we'll be more than happy to share. Okay. Thank you so very much. This has been really awesome. Thank you for participating and for listening. Thank you to, to the presenters who so ably conducted the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Carr and the panelists. Please, another round of applause for them. And there was actually a question that came in, a Facebook question, and she says, I can still ask it, and they'll hear me around there, so don't go too far. The question was, how can parent groups register for training through the parent council? And we'll just give him a minute just to answer because possibly somebody here might want to know as well. Thank you. There is a division within the commission, Parenting Support Division. You contact us 967-7977. Or, or you can send us an email at nationalparentingsupport at moey.gov.jm. So that's 967-7977. And we'll take you through the procedures. All right, thank you, 967-7977, for those of you who would like to get in touch with them. All right, great. And so now we're moving on to our third session of the day, entitled Livelihoods. Who doesn't want one of those, right? Don't look at me like that. Isn't that what it's all about? 
Yes, we all want a livelihood and a good one too. So we're going to welcome moderator Ms. Charmaine Brim. She is a technical specialist of the Socioeconomic Development Community Renewal Program at PIOJ. And she is going to introduce her panel. And they're going to talk about livelihoods. That's a very big deal to us, especially in a developing country, where depending on the kind of livelihood that you have, that determines the quality of life. And as you heard a while ago, the quality of parenting and all the other things that flow from that. So please make them very welcome. Talking about livelihoods, Charmaine Brim and company. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, fellow colleagues, our community representatives, the media, masters of ceremonies, good afternoon. Is it morning or oh, good morning? Vision 2030 Jamaica National Development Plan emphasizes the importance of entrepreneurship as an engine of, for economic growth and development. Within this context, it is important to know and to answer the question, how does entrepreneurial activities contribute to national prosperity? As we seek to answer that question, therefore, we must take the time to understand the role that entrepreneurs play in this process. According to Professor Paul Golding from UTEC, Entrepreneurs are key actors in turning low productivity around to create lasting economic benefits and quality jobs. It is therefore imperative that we create an economic environment which enables businesses to innovate and compete to increase productivity and growth into quality employees. If the country's growth agenda is not realized, the cycle of low growth and high debt that resulted in sustained high unemployment rates, large-scale emigration of labor, and high poverty rates will continue. If we as a country are to address these issues, then a major policy shift has to occur, which will require and ensure that the capacity of our Jamaican companies are able to innovate and grow. I am Charmaine Brim. I'm the Technical Specialist for Socioeconomic Development at the Planning Institute of Jamaica, and I will be your moderator for the livelihood session. As we think about the issue of entrepreneurship and livelihood, it is very important that we understand the importance of creating an enabling environment through policy, we have to understand the importance of using data to inform our program development, and therefore, how those, having the enabling environment and the adequate program will lead to effective implementation. I'm happy this morning that we will be able to showcase three best practices that are occurring across the island from an organizational level, leading down to community, the community grassroots level. And with me this morning, our panelists, we have Mr. Damian Young from the Clarendon Municipal Corporation, Mr. Herman Shim from the Caribbean Maritime University, Mrs. Nicole Manning from Hartrust NTA, and Dr. Kadamame Naif. Now, in, let me just quickly introduce Mr. Young, who will be our first speaker. Mr. Young consults as a local economic development officer with responsibility for the parish of Clarendon through the Ministry of Local Government and Community Development at the Car Clarendon Municipal Corporation. He's a justice of the peace and holds a master's degree from the University of the West Indies in public sector management, a BSc honors degree in program and project management from the in International University of Caribbean, and a diploma in education from the Michael University College. Mr. Young was one of six Jamaicans engaged and exposed by the Caribbean Local Economic Development Project, CARILED, to visit municipalities across Canada to observe LED in practice in 2015. 
And so in his current capacity as the officer responsible for LED, he has made indelible marks developing programs for the exploration of indigenous products, as well as he has done several projects resulting in economic livelihood improvements for vulnerable groups in Clarendon. Mr. Young is the former president of the Spalding Citizens Association and the current vice president for the Maypen Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Could you make me welcome, help me to welcome Mr. Damian Young. Thank you very much, Ms. Moderator. I bring you warm greetings from the hills of Clarendon and the grassy plains. I bring you warm greetings from the parish which will have the first aerotropolis in Jamaica. And I bring you warm greetings from the parish that produced the likes of Claude Mackay, who said, if we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and penned. And again he says, lovely dainty Spanish kneel with your yellow flower and white. And I bring you greetings from the parish that has one of the coolest mineral baths, the Milk River Mineral Bath and Spa. How are you today? If you see me appearing nervous, it's because it's the first time I have been in a room filled with so many charming women. <laughs> Not least of which is you, Miss Brim. And I would like to say that when I Listen to the Vision 2030 this morning. I'm really tempted again and again to believe that why they say Jamaica, place to live and raise family and do business, is because of our blessed women. God is good to us. Hurrying through my presentation, just to make a few points that the local government reform and uh, the local planning and development are policies that have helped to shape what you are going to hear on the, the program that I am responsible for, local economic development. And before I go any further, is Mr. Rupert, Rupert Price still here? Mr. Price, are you here? If not, I, I really want to commend him and the Ministry of Local Government for the work that they have been doing. And again, I want to backtrack and also commend the Planning Institute of Jamaica and their team that have been really unearthing or giving a forum to agencies or programs like what we are doing at the local level. A number of countries, including Jamaica, have committed themselves to implement Agenda 21, which is a non-binding, voluntarily implemented action plan deemed fundamental to achieving sustainable development in the 21st century. As a result of this commitment, Jamaica has been undergoing a program of local government reform. Included in this local government reform process are three strategic laws, Local Government Governance Act, the Local Government Financing and Financial Management Act, and the Local Government Act, which speaks to unite, unified services and employment. Critical also is the entrenchment of local government in the Constitution, so that in case there are changes in administration, it does not disrupt the flow. And of course, the promulgation of new national building bill. But very instrumental is the recognition and the development of local economic activities at the local level, municipal corporation level, community level. Under the Local Sustainable Development Plan, which is a critical tool and policy, primarily within our parish, it's important to note that Jamaica had to devolve authority for local planning to local government, essentially mandating the local authorities to develop their own sustainable development plans. In February of 2016, in partnership with several agencies, such as our own Parish Development Committee, National Housing Trust, the Sugar Transformation Unit, and of course SDC, we launched our Clarendon Local Sustainable Development Plan. 
which is really a roadmap, a blueprint for developing the resources of the parish, addressing the needs and concerns that we face as a people, and how we can harness all of these into growth strategies. This process, which is guided by a document, is built around the four fundamental components of sustainable development. Environmental action, social well-being, economic prosperity, and good governance. The Clarendon Local Sustainable Development Plan represents a bottom-up approach as it seeks to really put together all of the visions and the ideas of persons within the communities of Clarendon, putting it into one document so that they can have a voice in the development of the CLSDP. The vision is to make Clarendon a thriving parish with a healthy, educated, and creative population that live in safe and attractive communities. I would now like to turn your focus to local economic development in Clarendon. As a policy initiative coming from the local government reform process and directly tied uh, with the LSDP, lead was born in Clarendon. And this saw the employment or the engagement of a local economic development officer and the creation of an office, as well as creating the mandate and the purposes to guide that office. Local economic development is a process of unearthing or strengthening existing initiatives which possess the potential to create employment and contribute to economic growth. The ministry's mandate is that the LED program will provide a springboard for the transformation of communities throughout the country. This program will provide the opportunity to achieve meaningful economic growth and job creation. Ladies and gentlemen, since, since the establishment of this lead program for Clarendon, there have been two best practices that we have been working on, which are the Clarendon Youth in Business Project and the Maypen Business Improvement District. Please turn. I would like to draw your attention. Continue. And continue. I would like to draw your attention to some of the activities under this Youth in Business project. But just to say that within this project, which was created in July of 2016, the municipal corporation really looked at how, as a parish, we can begin to address some of the ills affecting young people. Our parish, as you would know, suffers from crime and violence, and unemployment is also one of the challenges we face. In fact, data showed us that Around 2015-16, Statin advised us that at least 30% of our youth were unemployed. And not just at the national level, but we saw that at our local level. And certainly this was cause for concern and warrant us doing something to remedy the situation. And so the Youth in Business project was born. And this saw us looking at providing a serious measure to address the ills faced by our youth. Uh, we looked at putting together a program which essentially saw the strengthening of young people in business. It saw the provision of sustained monitoring and mentoring of these youth as they continued their business activities. It also saw us promoting and supporting original and economically sustainable businesses led by both male and female youth within our parish. Provision of fundamental core business skills and knowledge. So we would provide them, of course, with training in bookkeeping, finance management, uh, product and service standards development, skills in marketing, and so forth. Provision of entrepreneurial technical skills were also shared with them in partnership with Hartrust, essentially through their vocational training development institute. So that these youth, as they go about doing their business, would be more adaptable, more resilient. The areas that they came from included agro-processing, agriculture, small-scale businesses such as baking. Uh, in fact, here we have Donovan Spencer and Romeo Mitchell and Kean, I beg your pardon, Keisha Scott. All three of them are doing unique businesses. When you go outside, please check their booth. Romeo Mitchell is producing sauce 
Donovan Spencer is making baby clothing. And uh, Miss Keisha Scott is making bed, clothing, pillows, and so forth. We had several partners as we go about doing this project. We had strong partnership through CARLED and certainly the Planning Institute of Jamaica, JBDC, Harchus, NCB, the Ministry of Local Government, and others. In fact, I would like to share with you that since the inception of this program, at least 15 youth have received certificate, health, health certificate to signa signal that they have been trained in observance of best hygiene and, uh, and food safety practices. Uh, 32 youth-led businesses have received registration from the Companies Office of Jamaica. Over 40 businesses have received grant funding ranging from $100,000 to $150,000. And hurrying down just to say to you that the program continues to be monitored Firstly, by the Jamaica National Small Business Loan and also the Mapen Chamber of Commerce and Industry so that we can continue to track and see how well these youth are progressing over the years. It gives me pleasure to tell you that the program is going into its third year and we are looking at making the 2019-2020 program even stronger as we engage more partners to ensure that the youth receive sufficient support to continue in their business activities. In fact, that slide is showing you that one of the youngsters, Nicholas Chambers, appeared on the Smile Jamaica TV program one morning. He is a plastic welder, one of the only ones in our country. You burst your plastic drum, he is able to come and weld it for you. You don't have to buy a new one. Some of the strengths of the program include the fact that we do not give them cash in hand, but they have to produce their invoices and the checks, the funds is made payable to their supplier. The corporation supports the program strongly and is indeed looking at funding it for 2019-2020, the lion's share of it, that is. We are experiencing nearly 100% success rate in terms of youth continuing in business after a year. And uh, the corporation is not really seen as a savior, but more as a facilitator of the program, a partner that hold their hands and lead them or guide them into developing their, their businesses to the best of their abilities. A second initiative that I now want to share with you very quickly is the Mapen Business Improvement District. Uh, business Improvement Districts are really a public-private partnership in which property and business owners elect to make a collective contribution to the maintenance and development and proportion of their commercial district. Essentially, these public-private partners look at the issues affecting the, their business area in terms of garbage pileup, poor directional signs, pothole-riddled thoroughfare, poor drainage, and the general untidiness of a town, and look at ways that they can come together to address these issues. And so a committee has been formed in Mapen, which includes persons from the banking industry, hardware, supermarket, uh, clothes traders, agencies such as SDC, National Work Agency, NWC, and JPS. And on a monthly basis, meetings are held to craft ways to address the issues that we face as a local municipality. It's important to note that the Business Improvement District is not a substitute for, for government and the activities that government should perform. But the BID is really more of a coordinating partner that seeks to lobby for the business community and essentially look at how the commercial space can be improved and be made friendlier for shoppers and the business people alike. There are distinct advantages in having a business improvement district in your location. Uh, what the Business Improvement District allows for, issues needing governmental support and affecting businesses can be addressed much, much quickly, much quicker, such as repairs to roads or garbage collection. So if you come to the town of Mapen, you will see increase in the number 
of garbage bins throughout the thoroughfare. We are looking at putting in planter boxes. We have put in closed caption television cameras. We have repaired some of our roadways and we continue to see how we can improve the operations of the municipal cooperation. It's sustained by our regular meetings. You will see our mayor going through the town and greeting business persons and ensuring that issues and concerns are listened to. And of course, we really continue to see how we can improve the general appearance of the town, making it safer, not that we are experiencing all the success we want to yet, but making it safer and cleaner and friendlier and more welcoming. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Young. You know, as I listened to your presentation, there are some key things. We were speaking about best practices, and we heard things like bottom-up approach, which I think is very, very important in effective community development. We heard clearly the, what the sustainability plans were, the issue of partnership, and that partnership being public-private partnership and engagement of the communities in, in the execution of any program. So we do commend the municipality for the work that they're doing, and thank you so much for coming and sharing that with us. Let me just introduce quickly our next presenter, Mr. Herman Shim, who is employed to the Caribbean Maritime University as a researcher with special focus on alternative energy. In this regard, he has extensive experience in the areas of renewable energy design, project management, electronics technology and ICT, structured cabling systems, fiber and copper, to name a few. Mr. Shim also lectures at the university and has developed a short course in solid state lighting and solar PV, which is delivered to students. Among his notable achievements in the area of LED technology are the development and presentation of the LED cottage-based industry project, which has received funding through GEF, which has also expanded to Grenada. The expansion of the LED project as an economically viable social intervention and its participation at the COP21 Paris and COP22 Morocco Public-Private Partnership Conference in Washington, D.C. Mr. Shim holds a diploma in business administration from the New York Business School, certificate in computer technology, electronics from Control Data Institute and a Certificate in Sustainable Energy from the Arizona State University. Please help me to welcome Mr. Shim to the podium. Thank you, Charmaine. Good morning, all. I bring you greetings also from the Caribbean Maritime University. We have the best view of any university in Jamaica, right by the sea. I think Charmaine planned this deliberately. LED, my colleague to my left, local employment, economic development. My LED, light emitting diode. Um, I'll start by introducing ourselves. We have a cohort of over 4,000 Jamaican students. Our main campus is on the Palisades Road. The vision that drives us to be the innovators that we are. Because our purpose is, as an educational institution is to make sure that it's not just academics. It must be tangible if we are serious about developing the country. Look at the Caribbean Maritime. You hear where we have youngsters come in being trained to solve problems at sea. There is no repair shop nearby. It has to be done to get that ship back on schedule in real time. So we took the same approach in that innovation let me carry you through it. So, we welcome you with the picture. One day, perhaps, we'll take a boat and you come on our dock and our graduates and our cadets will welcome you all. 
Next one, please. Okay. The project itself. How it was funded was through the Jeff SGP, their small grants program, and they asked us in our deliverables, find a way to use this technology to get to the young people of Jamaica who were at risk. Find a way to train them. Find a way to use this to provide a meaningful employment opportunity for them that's sustainable. Empowering young people in marginalized communities in Jamaica and Barbados. Actually, we went to Grenada. We're still working on Barbados. Through research, income generating aspect of this program. So that is what drove us to actually come up with our project. That's where the funding came from. Next, please. It has to be pertinent. So we found that linkage with our sustainable development goals, how it fits, and it fits actually eight of them. Next, please. We also had to look at our vision 2030 and the medium term goals. How does it fit there? And of the MTGs, we cover three. Next. So we look and we're guided by words that can guide us. That one came to me as I was presenting, preparing the presentation, and it struck home. Let me introduce as this section, accompanying me and my team, and CMU's team is Dr. Roden, Stephen Roden. He's in charge of the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Technology. Beside him is Mr. Kerry Grant, who came to us through the CAP program and is now my key assistant. So we're trying to put meat onto this project. Our first attempt was to take the old JPS, what we call M250 street lamps, which were using 250 watts, and convert them to a 100, 100 watt LED. That was the unit. There's Kerry completing it. Next, please. And there's it installed at the CMU. Now, as with any new development, any prototyping, and then after that, um, market-ready product, there are challenges. We have experienced those challenges firsthand. Okay? There, there's particular challenges. How reliable are your suppliers? And that, my friends, is one of the biggest challenges when we go into this that we have to face. Next, please. So the completed work is now at JIPO, patent pending. Next, please. So we are able, with our project, to assemble domestic lights industrial lights, all based on LEDs. In Grenada, we carried it, and we have been through many communities, and I'll point out some, from 2013 to now. Now, the impact, we've been to Port Royal, Queensbury, Olympic Gardens, Dela Creepen, Swallowfield, Majesty Gardens, Parade Gardens, through the USAID Comets funding, we trained over 65 students at the CMU in both LED bidding um, short course and solar PV short course. We've been to Grenada, where we trained upward of 20 students to do it. Our program has 
caught the attention of the UNDP head office. And there's a web link where the head office came down and interviewed myself and Kerry, and it is posted on their website. Next, please. None of this could have been done without collaboration. The SDC, Ms. Goldburn, I have a long list of all the lists, I have most names is through the SDC, and I thank you. You see some familiar faces. Ms. Brim right there. Through the EHF, Environmental Health Foundation, we, Ms. Buchanan from Parade Gardens, we're looking to start and hopefully it will be st the first solution will probably be installed in Prairie Gardens. We were invited to Paris to present, which we did, and I'll share a comment with you. After we presented at the Caribbean Pavilion, um, one of the attendees stood up and said, all of you in here have common identified problems. This is the only one I see have presented a solution. <laughs> we were also invited to Morocco, COP22. And through the HRA, we presented in Washington at a conference they had to look at ways of employing young people. Here also was very some, something that was very significant. We were actually applauded by the PPP in Washington that our project fits directly with the private-public po private partnership arrangement. And this was when we presented that the first phase was actually done jointly with the JPS. Although we had problems to work out, which we eventually did, the partnership with the JPS was primarily the most significant in Washington. So how do we carry this forward now? We have all the data. We, using that data, we structured the course content because you can't teach everybody the same way. Our courses, being short courses, had to make an impact. And to do that, what we did was, yes, some amount of the theory, but a lot of it hands-on. And that worked. So, my, I'll take this opportunity to say to you, the CBO is here, the company is here. To carry this further requires not for the CMU to execute this, for us to assist, for us to develop for us to train, but the executors of this has to be you. You work in these communities, you know the youngsters. If I can convince you that this is an idea that can take traction, talk with us, because you are the ones, you are going to have to be the change agents. The whole LED cottage industry concept is to develop modular, small, assembly units that are installed in communities, but they collaborate with each other. One plant, where we estimate it, can build maybe a thousand units a week. Now suppose a particular client needs 10,000. Then one of the things we insist when we roll this out in our design of the project is that you have to sign a collaborative contract 
where we would take the large order and assign it to 700 modular plants. Hopefully, that will break down the division between communities and provide a livelihood that is sustainable. You are addressing two things. You are addressing means of lowering our carbon footprint. Energy efficiency does that. And you are solving your community problem with giving meaningful employment to young people. The monitoring and evaluation and the data collection continues. Hopefully, my staff will be more than three. And I put a plug in to Dr. Roden to have this where it's not, it's not just going to end, it will continue to grow. Um, we have information on how many women, the age group, how many boys, how many communities, what they can produce, all of that information has been tabulated and kept. Next, please. So, the LED, I heard the term on one of my trips, disruptive. The last disruptive technology we all, and myself personally, experienced was the computer technology. I used to work on the system that was running Bank of Jamaica. I come down here and I say, oh, geez, that brings back memories. When I first installed that mainframe, I fell asleep under it when I was finished. And Mr. Manning came and woke me up. So I knew what it was to operate a mainframe and the mainframe systems. That changed when you ended up with laptops, personal computers. The LED is going to do the same thing. As a matter of fact, I started to do the same thing. So, that gentleman from Harvard coined the phrase. It will produce goods, services for those who get involved. And the best thing is, put yourself higher up the value chain. Thank you very much. Wow. There are a number of wow moments in your presentation, Mr. Shim. I particularly liked the approach to learning and that acknowledgement that not everyone learns the same way. And I think that's so important at the academic level that we understand the difference in learning and therefore we gear our, our, our teaching styles to, to accommodate the different learning patterns. So I think that's really excellent. I like the replicability so far of what you have done. Um, not only have you replicated in a number of communities locally, but for it to have been taken to Grenada, you know, putting Jamaica on the map again with a model that clearly works. And I like the consideration and recognition of the SDGs and the Vision 2030 model because a lot of times questions emerge, you know, persons will say they don't understand how Vision 2030 is localized. But I think Mr. Shim just explained in a very clear way how the work that you are doing is actually contributing to national development. So thank you so much, Mr. Shim, for your, your presentation. Our next speaker is Mrs. Nicole Manning. She is the Senior Director of Corporate Planning and Strategic Development. At the Heart Trust NTA. And she is a graduate of the University of the West Indies where she obtained a double major in Chemistry and Management Studies and a Master's Degree in Management Information Systems. She has attended the University of Technology, where she completed her postgraduate qualification in education. She's currently a doctoral candidate at the Nova Southern University with focus on organizational leadership. 
She's an internationally certified ISO 9001 and 14001 lead auditor and a certified trainer for SAME. She also has professional certifications in strategic planning, quality, risk, change, and project management. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an expert panel in our midst, so help me just add to that and welcome Mrs. Nicole Manning. Thank you, Ms. Brim. Our Masters of Ceremonies, Mrs. Audrey Williams and Mr. Duane Burbick. Um, my fellow colleagues, panelists, I greet you on behalf of Dr. Janet Dial, our Managing Director of the Heart Trust NTA and the team members of our merged entity. We were recently merged with the Jamaican Foundation for Lifelong Learning as well as the National Youth Service something that has gained some efficiencies and effectiveness for the, for the country on a whole. So I want to share today just a few things, um, specifically one, I'm gonna focus on dual certification, and I want us to look at how the trust has been impacting the lives of Jamaicans. So, our main focus is really to facilitate and ensure the development of human capital, which means that our interest rests with the development of all. The unattached youth, we have spoken about them many times, but we have gone more than speaking. We have looked at how we can build strategies to meet the needs of these individuals, but not so much the building the needs initially, but also looking at how we can attend to lifelong learning matters, which is where I really want to focus. So let me give you some foundation work and then we will get to the main components. So our key mechanisms that we use to achieve our mission, first and foremost, is partnership. Now that is not a strange concept because our, my other colleagues would have mentioned that we cannot survive in this world without collaboration. We cannot survive in this world without partnerships. Our parenting group would have, we're probably not so delved into it, but our neighboring concept is something that we grew up with. And it is something that we use strategically in the world of work. So partnerships for the trust, we have it both with our private and public partners, but as well as our community level, and they are non-governmental organizations. We have non-profit organizations also that we work with, our churches and so on. And not least, but very much important because there are 3% contributors, our firms, our employers. Now this is, those are the persons who contribute and build the foundation for the trust and allows us as an entity not only to develop strategies but also to share them and to implement them locally and at the Caribbean level. We also maintain our heart-operated institutions. And so as we move on, and I'm going to say good practice because, you see, internationally it is recognized that you have many practice, many good practice. To say it's best practice means that I'd have to do a comparison right across. So I'm going to lean towards that right now. And so what we're trying to do as a trust is to build that greater flexibility. Now my colleague Mr. Shim would have mentioned about the different learning styles and Ms. Brim had caught on to it. And it's very important for us in terms of competency-based framework that we use to deliver our programs. And so what we're saying is we may have a program of structured development, a program development framework, but many other entities have the same thing. So we are not going to be duplicating. What we're saying is we're utilizing the structures that exist within the country and whether the program is developed by heart or it is developed by another entity like the Caribbean Maritime University, the recognition that comes from it any of us can gain that recognition. So the Heart Trust NTA, as we, will, we, have, we are reforming and transforming ourselves, renewing ourselves, are looking not only at what we produce with our framework, 
for both to match both local and international requirements, but also to ensure that we look at what other partners are utilizing and are developing. Now, of course, all of this has to be hinged and aligned with what we call labor market demands or national priorities. So there are many policy frameworks that exist out there. For example, the whole concept of digitization. So if it is that we have a policy to digitize our records nationally, then it means that as the trust, we have to ensure that we develop the competences necessarily in our human, necessary in our human capital in order to have the implementation of such a policy. That said, we have to do it in line with what currently exists in the international market because we want our persons to be able to move. Mobility is critical for us. Saying that, I want to then pull our attention to the national vocational qualification of Jamaica and the Caribbean vocational qualification. I'm not sure how many of you know, but the national vocational qualification of Jamaica is accepted both locally and in the Caribbean and internationally. And so I'm separating the three because I want us to understand that Jamaica would, would have been first out of the block and Jamaica would have been the, um, the country that would have ushered Trinidad, Barbados, now Grenada, St. Lucia, and several others to understand how to develop, develop these qualifications. What is extremely important is that there is also a Caribbean association that now validates these, qualification, these qualifications and they will now, and they have been, sorry, moving to what we call Caribbean vocational qualification. Why is this so important? It's important because it allows our artisans to move from country to country. So if it is that an individual has this certificate, unlike many of our degrees, when you go to Canada, your national qualification of Jamaica is accepted directly. You need no translation. Now the vocational qualification is delivered many places. It's delivered in, as I said before, as we partner with them, our public and private training providers. But what is most important is that it's also delivered on the job. It's done face-to-face, -face, it's done online. So the flexibility that is there is what I want to share with us. And I want us to understand that the improved delivery as we have it here is that we have moved from an instructor-focused type of learning to a student-centered learning. So it's all about the learner. It's all about the focus on how I change, how I can learn, how I, my professional profile. And I want us as individuals to understand that as learners are engaged at multiple sites, you don't have to redo anything. Once competencies are recognized at one location, they are accepted because there are robust mechanisms could you change? Right. Robust quality assurance and monitoring and evaluation framework and mechanisms in place to give us that confidence in what has been gained at one university or an institution, whether it's in the community or whether it's online, to move on. Many times we go elsewhere and we have to do some extra equivalency and validation and work, and you have to spend sometimes months to get that kind of um, translation done. What we're saying is, once we ensure and understand that these qualifications are attained within this kind of framework, then we can accept them. Now, critical for us for these qualifications is to ensure that they're aligned. And so, for, for the alignment, could you go back a little, please? For the alignment, we have what is called our labor market information portal. There is a website, I had a picture there, but I'm not certain if we're gonna get it up, but the bottom line is that we do the labor market analysis for you. And so we are encouraging our employers, our institutions to use the resources, use the research already done. We have sector studies done in maybe about over 30 or 40 areas. And so what we're saying to, within the Vision 30, 2030, you'd have had ma nine major sectors. Industries within that and various disciplines, the studies are already done. 
So just go to the website and utilize them. What we have also done is to link them to careers that exist both local and international information that is there. So you don't need to redo the work. It's already there on the labor market information portal. So what we're saying is, as the national training agency moves to that level of ensuring that the information and the data is available for all to utilize, it will help not only us, but you in your planning mechanisms and guide your program development. That will also help with translation of equivalency. That will also help with the movement of our people. Now, if our persons are going to move, where are they going to move to? If it is that we would have aligned our programs, it means that there must be jobs. And we're saying whether we have the jobs that are created, like entrepreneurial activities that my dear Mr. Young would have mentioned, you also have jobs that persons can be placed in. And so what we're saying is we are trying to ensure that we develop other mechanisms, other programs, where we have a school leavers training program to facilitate school to work transition. What is also critical is the apprenticeship program. Undoubtedly, this kind of um, mechanism has worked in many countries. Germany is a big testament to that. Where when, once persons are trained and they are already placed in a job, just imagine, it is already ready and valuable um, work experience that's there. And the firms know that. And once they are validated that, they're not going to let them go. So we're saying that it's one to have to understand the planning, it is two to do the training, but it's three to ensure that when these persons are certified that they get employed. Let us not be locked down though with the certification. And I want us to understand what dual certification means through our partnership for world-class employees. I want to bring your attention to how we transition from the NVQJ. It can be, of course, I said before, for employment, but also transition to other institutions. We now have what is called the Jamaica's National Qualifications Framework. I'm not sure how many of you are very aware and conversant with that document. It is something that every Jamaican should know. It's something that we'll be working with our employers to ensure that they understand how to do that translation. It is the one framework, a one sheeter. I'm so sorry it's not showing, showing up, but I had it there. But I want us to share it, and coming out of this symposium, it is something that everybody needs to see. It tells my qualification against the NVQJ, what it means, what's the equivalent. And so if I'm here locally or here in international, going into the international market, for me to be placed in a job is not a problem. And for me to have further education, it's not a problem because I understand the translation and how I move. So my NVQJ level three, equivalent to a diploma, can allow me to transition to another entity. Oh, so this is the labor market information portal showing up now. It's a little late, but you can go ahead. Thanks very much. So let me move on to how we impact, how we have been impacting lives. And I'm just going to show you six persons. Now these six, for the most, most, most part, sorry, we have done thousands, hundreds of thousands of persons like these coming from various backgrounds. And this group was called the Magnificent Six because they were the one of the group of our first testament of how we can have two certification at one go, two different certification. And so these guys would have had, one girl is in it, yes, one young lady is in it, and these persons would have had the a national vocational qualification in executive chef. But it didn't stop there. They also went to the Culinary Institute of America. And in the, with the Culinary Institute of America, the persons would have accepted the national vocational qualification as is. And with that acceptance, these individuals would have gone to do the pro chef level three. Having done that, they are now executive chefs in the right of both the international and the local market. Now what it does, it shows that seamless transition and it also shows that it does not have to only be with the persons within the realm that we function. What we're trying to do is to bring us to the level that we're operating in, a, operating in a global market. So if you're an entrepreneur here, it means that you have the potential to be an entrepreneur in the 
international market. That said, where are our six international executive chefs? Canada, Dubai, Jamaica, and they are in the US also. And so I'm showing you a few testimonies there where you would have had from two of them, one at the Cardiff and one now at the Pegasus. What I want to show is from this map, testament to the fact that we are training right across. We are certifying right across, as well as we are making sure that the alignment is there with labor market and, or labor market, sorry, and to ensure that we are placing our persons. While we are not there yet, there is significant evidence that we are on our way, on our way as we continue to impact the lives of Jamaicans. Thank you. The theme of this symposium is operationalizing best practices, or if I go based on what Mrs. Manning said, good practices at the policy program and community levels. I refer to that because I think your presentation, Mrs. Manning, clearly outlined from a national entity how the three things work together, how it transitions from, from policy, how it informs program development, how it informs delivery, how it informs the, the creation of, of, of the, the level of certification that is utilized. Um, I, I particularly liked the reference to utilizing structures across country so that we don't duplicate. And it's important that we know that. I think that Jamaica has a number of good things or good structures in place, but we are not necessarily aware of them. And the fact that we can access certain information to, in fact, prevent us from doing the double work. So thank you so much, Mrs. Manning, for that presentation. Now we are going to segue into a panel discussion. And this individual is no stranger to Jamaica <laughs> or to, 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 to any of us. Dr. Knife is a noted lecturer, uh, a social entrepreneur himself. He is the director of CETP at the UWI Mona School. And he is noted for his passion as it relates to development, whether at policy level or particularly at the community level. And so I'm going to invite Dr. Knife to, to guide us through the policy discussion. And we will be focusing on Answering the question, have government policies over the years created the necessary environment for livelihoods to flourish? If not, what recommendations would, we, would you put going forward? So welcome, Dr. Knife, please. Let me just start by thanking the, the team for organizing this thing. I'm going to behave like I'm a, a teacher, which I'm not. See? No. I look at this document right here, and um, I see some faces and some names, and we are speaking about policy. I just want to know if these persons are in the room. We have Dr. Wayne Henry, my brother from campus, as the director of PIOJ. We have Sweeney from JSIF, who's up, 10 minutes for the presentation or 15 minutes? 10 minutes? 10 minutes? Okay, all right, Sweeney. Now we have Mr. Robinson here from Ministry of National Security. The version from JPS. You have the paper, you know, the JPS. But the colleague from NHT. My next version, Dr. Vernon from SDC. The sister from FHI 360. All those persons gave readings this morning, and we are speaking about policy. Why do I mention those things? Policy implementation is actually dependent upon the leadership of the organization. The leadership of the organization, as I present here, is being said, I don't know how they are going to do what should be done. And the fundamental problem with policy implementation in Jamaica is not information, it's about people making decisions and collaborating on these things. We take too much second hand information. So they are not here, and the, the thinking is now that the members of your team is going to go back to those organizations to tell them what has happened in the presentation. There's a joke. You know? But let me just continue. <laughs> what needs to be done. So we have that thing there. The policy, the main claim I'm making right here is that the policy landscape has always been good. 
in that absence of the information, what we really need to do is to try and connect those dots because we have all these programs existing. Yes, we have all that is required for this livelihood sector to move, but we just don't put in place the things that we need to put in place in terms of working together. So I'm saying that essentially the framework, the policy that has been developed over the years, we do have gaps. What we have done is fail to seize the many opportunities that actually exist to let this thing here work properly. And we've been discussing about Vision 2030 and the SDGs. Let's look at the SDGs. Everything that is done by MSMEs in Jamaica and social enterprises actually address the components of the SDGs. Whether it be to deal with poverty or to get rid of hunger, or to deal with gender, all of those issues are addressed by the, by the, SD, by the MSMEs. If you look at what Vision 2030 is and the four components, it's the same thing as well. Jamaica, the place of choice, live, work, raise families, and do business. Those things are broken up to three broad areas. Yes, and the SDGs. Economic value creation, social value creation, and of course, biodiversity, sustainability. That's at the macro level. What you require is to go at the micro level. And you said the same thing happened at the micro level with the MSMEs. They address economic issues, they address social issues, and they also address environmental issues. It's not no magic. These are things that people are doing, and we just need to continue to do them and do them well. So I am saying that the policy framework has emerged of what we call an experiential learning approach, which is learning by doing. It is not just about theory. We have a lot of research that is being done. Yes, over 10 pieces of research has been done that has informed the last revised MSME policy. Yes, over the last six years. Practices, there are more than 14 programs well over US 30 million. There's about 30 million of those three programs, you know, and you see later in the presentation. Over 30 million dollars, countless more programs existing, well, there are millions of dollars as well. Several tools have been developed and applied in practice within the sector. There are several funding sources or entities available to be accessed by the sector. And we keep saying that we don't have any money. I mean, I don't see that out there. A lot of money is out there. I mean, and persons might not know, but a lot of money is out there. But again, the people who made these greetings are not here. And they keep talking about this money thing. Hey, they must have said things we don't have to do while we're here. We're here because we think it is important. Yes? I have a robust one called potential ecosystem. Why use the word potential again? Because it takes the minds of these leaders to come together to make sure that we solidify the ecosystem. And they are not here. All right, okay, all right. let me just go through this thing here. This collage is to show you some of the research that has been done. A whole lot of research has been done. If I move to the next slide, you'll see exactly what I'm saying. Now, most of the research of the MSME actually started to work with the police, you know, because the police were trying to understand how do we build community safety and security. They recognize that broke pocket don't work. You can't engage young people who don't have money to tell them to join programs that don't generate funds. So therefore, the JSF was the one who was pushing this thing here of the MSME because they wanted to engage young people. A tons of research has been done. We don't need to go through all of them, but you just wanted to see that the research has been done. If I move to the next slide, specifically relating to MSME and social enterprise programs, these research were done and financed by a number of entities that created and filled a number of programs that developed for the country. From as early as 2013, you, you see some of them, the SEBI programs, the CRP programs, we did research on the baseline and the sector, we did thing on creating social enterprises across Jamaica through the Comet 2 program, did sell of programs? There are so many programs out there. We're not short of programs in our research. So the five minutes sign, you know, this is the next thing which... Now, what are some of the, the programs that actually exist out there? Let us look at some of the programs, please. I guess the greetings, please get a lot of time to make greetings on. I could just continue. All right, programs. So look at these programs. Did you sell foundation back to roots programs? Over 100 committees they have engaged over the last 10 years. USAID Comet program address engage about 40 communities. That program valued about 15 million US dollar. SEBI 1 and 2 got 2 million US. They established about 35 organizations. RAD have over 200 farmers groups. SDC, the Avril right there, 450 at the local economic development initiative groups. With no budget. With no budget. JSF has just done their inner community development program. JSF have a bag of money. That's why Sweden should be inside here. A whole lot of money, which I'm not spending. Yes? Those persons need to be inside this room. 
The British Council has supported the Queen Young Leaders program through the Digital Foundation and Sandals Foundation. JSF Ready To program is going to come on board by December. I mean, we have a lot of meaningful programs. JBDC have thousands upon thousands of thousands of persons who they have supported and can't even get production space down by the industrial park. <laughs> They're paying about $4 million to rent a building. It won't make sense. I am saying we have what is required to get this thing here moving. Can we move to the next slide, please? Now, the tools to do this work is already there. Through our center, we have a number of these tools. Indices to look at the governance structures. We have indices also to measure your readiness as an enterprise if you should get funding. Yes, we have done things to actually monetize the value of the work being done by organizations, whether it's social work, environmental work, or traditional economic work. Practice tools are there. We have policies and procedural managers that have been applied to many of these programs. Then we have all these portfolios. And we have a lot of M&E framework and tracer systems. All of these things are there. And sometimes I say, well, colleagues take a lot of money and carry down some people from non-Jamaican places, you know, to come and teach people about business model canvas. Some that every SDC officer teaches their community to use. I mean, it's so much madness taking place in the country. All right, now, resources. There are numerous funding sources. See them listed on the board right there. And most of the time, they don't get proper call for proposals. A lot of the time, the funding is not spent. Again, JSF ready to I put JSF at the top because JSF have tons of funds. We then start talking about places like Chase, you know. Those things are there. The tourism enhancement fund is there. People who are MSMEs are involved in tourism and can't get any money. And the money is sitting down in the TEF. Yes? NHT has done a lot of work with their social venture program around the 140 communities. The Jamaica Stock Exchange is coming on with their social program as well. It's a crowdfunding platform to support social enterprises. A number of local foundations, Digital Foundation in particular, I want to applaud because I think they are the front runners in this kind of thing about MSME from the private sector standpoint. Now, USAID has spent the most money on development programs in the country, by far. By far. IADB, now of the Blue Water program, they're giving people 150,000 to 500,000 US for a project. European Union has supported a lot of programs. The British Council, they know they have the social enterprise programs in school and they support a number of programs. And the Caribbean Development Bank, I just spoke to the former PR person at the Caribbean Development Bank. They said, a lot of money there, we have not been applying for any of the money. So we don't want to buy the table, we broke out of any money. We're not short of anything in the country. So the ecosystem, this potential ecosystem, if you look at the business life cycle, they move from the limited stage, you have a number of institutions to support you. All these universities, the CETP at UA, UTEC, NCU, UCC, CMU, you have HART, let me apologize for not putting the name right there, because HART was the first entrepreneurship program in the CEFI program years ago. Then you have state entities, JBDC, RADA, SRC, BSJ, those will help you with the ideation stage. The startup phase, no, we'll go back to the side version. The startup phase, JBDC, Moon Enterprise and Commercialization Center, UE, TIC, which is at UTEC, Branson Centers, those are help at the startup phase. When you're going to the growth phase, go to the SEBI Accelerator Program, go to JBDC, go to MEC. Know that JBDC name is mentioned everywhere along the business cycle, you know, and then don't get a proper budget. And when you look at the business development cycle, there's the entity who is present everywhere along the cycle. At the mature stage, you go to JBDC and Jambro. Yes? And the innovation stage where innovators die, where you go again? You go to the universities because of innovation. Go to the SRC and you go to the BSJ. Now it's the end of the presentation. Now what is this big recommendation that I have for the organization? Please follow the slide for me. It's very simple. Embrace the Jamaicanness. We're not people who chat, 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 chat. Directors chat all the while. I'm saying all we need to do is just do it. Do what we need to do. And I hope that the person that are here just please mention to your directors that I made a statement. You know, next time I'm asked us to pray for and ensure they're here inside the room. Because a lot of them say that they don't know when you see them one on one. No, I go on knife. Everything good, man. I will start to talk. But we never know this. I'm never know. How must you know if you are not here? We must be here. Yes? So I'm going to say, just do it. And in doing it, remember that we say, one hand can't clap. Many and make the work like it. Means I must work together to get this thing here done. Give thanks. All right, so now 
Since we use that 10 minutes, that's all I have to say. Let us hear what has to be said, because again, we have examples of how these things work. So it's not in the ideation stage, we have people doing these things. A virgin from Central Clarendon showed some examples. I know him of this peace project, planting mescaline and round red peas. We can't get enough of those things in Jamaica, and we have no funds to do it. Your colleague at CMU has been doing some phenomenal work, and we understand what the role that CMU is going to play. Jamaica is going to be the logistics center, you know. This is not something I'm going to question, you know. Yes? Heart NTA, we went to Scotland, and we went to Scotland with Green and other colleagues. We found that the Heart NTA program is what the people in Scotland have been trying to mimic. We have the best training program almost in the world. Yes? So, we don't have to ask. But remember, Jamaica is the best in everything. You know? We're best in good things and we're best in bad things. So, we're just the best in what we do. You know? The question is whether we have the structures in place to support these things. Heart won't get broke because heart have an act. You know? So the act will support it. You know, CMU, CMU is a rising star, and because we know what the water is important, funding should be there. I wonder what's happening in Central Carolina. But the question is whether we think this policy framework that exists really supports what we want to get done. You know? And uh, so I want to pose this question first to the panel is here just for a second, 30 seconds, please, because I want to get the comments from the audience. And I will start with my colleague from Central Jamaica. And you probably need to move this. Yes, huh? What are you asking me? The question is whether the policy framework that exists supports your efforts in Central Jamaica. Excellent question. You hear me clearly? There are significant gaps. And... Uh, and the question he's asking me is aligned to an organization that I'm a part of and not the municipal cooperation. And it's the organization, as he said earlier, where we are doing, we are looking at supporting farmers in expanding the availability of local red peas and, and, and other crops. And the fact of the matter is, no, I don't think the, policy, the policies are sufficient. I believe oftentimes at the, at the macro level, the ideas are there, but by time the funding and the opportunities should trickle down to the bottom, it just dissipates and, and uh, the impact is not felt. And by the way, remember Jamaica import was 7 million US dollars out of red peas, which takes three months to grow. 7 million US dollars takes three months to grow. Same you. <laughs> I'll take Dr. Knife's advice and use less than 30 seconds. No. <laughs> yes. There's more to be done. There's more to be done, but we have the power to change it. And so, why, why would I, be, I would have been encouraging you to ensure that you redefine yourself, is to ensure that you force the hands of policy to work. Well, we have a, a large audience here, and most of you are practitioners, and you're out here having the experiences. You know, it would be good to hear what you have to say as you think about what the policy is here. When you try to get your things done, are there incentives in place? Do you have hiccups in getting the thing done? Do you have a smooth access to whatever you want to get, get done? And we don't want to behave shy, shy, let us press those things and start. Yes? Um, my comment as a representative for my community, Jeffrey Town in St. Mary. For years we've been involved in trying to get our community to be self-reliant. And um, whether it's in the issue of climate change, um, food security, job creation is something that we could never achieve. We have a lot of land, we are a farming community, and the support was never there to get our young people to, to work. Uh, we had to change our tact to go into agro-processing dealing with um, gluten-free products. And we're at a point now of um, into the marketplace. We have had a lot of assistance, not through government organizations, but through funding, accessing it, as you said, it's there. So I support your argument about just do it. If we wait on institutions, our policies to help us, dog and we suffer. Next. Person. Yes, Sister Ryder. Oh, Pauline Perry. Um, are you hearing me? 
Yes, clearly. I'm Pauline Perez. I'm the president of the Damton Benevolent Society. I'm also a just of the peace. Um, I must salute the gentleman from um, Maritime Institute. I'm not having a program right because I'm out of students from my community that have been attending that institution is and is so great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Dr. Knife mentioned there's a lot of money. But the thing is, some of the times when the proposal is being thrown out, I wonder if it's for the community persons. Because it's so complicated. They ask us so many things. By the time we forget I want to, to, to apply, the time up. Exactly. They need to make this proposal more, more simpler for the community persons. Yes, Yes, morning again. Dr. Yes. Knife, Greetings. from Trench Town, as you. Yeah. One of the, the, the things that I see with these entrepreneurial things, they, 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 they do it in a way that it doesn't really cater to the poor man, the little man. Mm -hmm. As we should say, sometimes you get a framework, it's the next day you're supposed to send in <laughs> documents, and this is really winning on us as young entrepreneurs who want to make something because the, the framework isn't right for us, so the policies don't go hand in hand with what we do. Yeah, we have some serious challenges right here. Any other comments? Oh. Yeah. PIOJ. Yes, at the back. Yes, thank you. Good, well, good afternoon. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Randy Finnegan from Spring Village Development Foundation over in Old Harbor. Certainly not. The policies, the, the gaps are perhaps even growing um, between um, government policies and actually what's it's, it's, it's being facilitated on the ground. Um, there really need to be a revisiting of, of how, what we mean by the things that we are saying. Because clearly, and I'm in agreement with what some of my other colleagues are saying, we really need to make a, a more determined effort to get activities from bottom up to be mainstreamed. There is a lot of red tape in the process, and as a result of that, you are, we're, what we're seeing on the ground too is a lot of frustration from young people. Um, you, you implement income generation projects with youth, but you, the same at-risk, unattached youth that you are setting up in some small income generating projects don't have the, the resources, whether it is land or the, the capital to sustain the initiative. So it was just an, a project and an announcement, but it's not intended to be last, you know, long lasting. And then you wonder, what was this about? Was it a PR stunt or was it aimed at transforming and sustaining communities? Yes, we're right here. Yes. Yes. I am Brian Davis, National Housing Trust Loan Portfolio Manager Officer who manage chronic accounts. Most of my mortgages operate as farmers in some place in Manchester and also in St. Elizabeth. My concern, I agree that the funding are not there for the farmers because some of these farmers, whenever situation occur where they have a, a don't, a don't their, 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 prop, their, their crops never really come, come to fruition. They, they are in a serious problems. There's nobody to assist them. There's no fallback there and rather they have no money either. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I am more concerned with project fatigue. I'm in the business of behavior change. When people are uncertain about their lives, they want to know that when you enter into their lives, you're there and you're going to remain for a while. And so my concern too is how ambitious some of the projects are. You might do a proposal that's very targeted, but then somewhere along the line, the project gets too big. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, the monies are spread so thinly that you can hardly get to do any one thing properly. And then my concern is how that impacts a life. Because as I said before, you, I, my concern is always my moral obligation. When I go into somebody's life, I want to make sure I'm doing it well, I'm intervening in a real way. So people are not stupid though. They also know that 
you're coming in based on a project and a project has a timeline mm -hmm. and you might disappear. So that's my little issue sometimes, that sometimes my proposals are very targeted and but, but, but things happen with it and before you know it, I'm concerned about the quality of the implementation. I think that I'm going to do what is called this support system and let me give an yeah. example of support system. So SDC operates in over 789 communities. How many SDC officers do you actually have? Now, JBDC operates in the same amount of communities in terms of supporting businesses. They have only about 100 business service providers. Rather, the same with 100 business service providers. The JCF, in terms of community safety and security, you have a very small cohort of police. What we are recognizing is everywhere that requires extension services, you do have enough people to provide extension services. Why is that so? Because they do have enough budget to do that also. Yes? And as I was saying, that the persons who are making these greetings need to be here, and the minister who responds for the money also needs to be here. I lament a lot about SDC in particular. You do have a capital budget. And they gave SDC must have $60 million last year to share over 789 communities. And you divide $60 million by 789, that comes to about $60 or $70,000 per community, which is a joke. You know what I mean? So that is where the concerns are. But I think. We need to look at, at, at um, recommendations. You no know, person of ideas. Yes, my virgin at the back. You can make the comment, but if you have a recommendation as well, I want you to make it as well, please. All right. So what I wanted to touch on was uh, a couple of things. But first of all, in terms of our officers coming from these various agencies, why aren't each officers um, educated and aware of the programs that can come from SDC? Because, like you said, we don't have enough for spread around. So make that one person that's in that one community, collective impact, one hand can't clap, him know about all three, all exactly. ten, whatever, so that when he's giving a talk and at a farmer's meeting or a community meeting and somebody comes up to him and he says, well, we can't really cover that, but have you looked into JBDC? I can bring in the farm next week, sit down with you, take it through, and I, and I realize that the communities have said this is the, uh, at the community level, sometimes the process is too complicated. Yes, there needs to be a simplification, but the checks and balances must still be there. And three, um, I agree with my brother over there. It's not, when we do these entrepreneurial things, we have to, it's not a PR stunt. We have to say that if you're doing something, is there a market for your product? Because you will, you will have little of uh, these entrepreneurial things where there's a small market, and once you're getting on your way, you've actually already saturated your market, so the sustainability is not there. We need to start, if we're going entrepreneurial, treat it like a business. It's not something to keep hands busy. You see, sometimes though, the market that we target is a wrong market because we have 3.5 million Jamaican people overseas who want all these things that are produced by these local people. But Jumbo focus is not on the Jamaican diaspora, really. They focus on trying to get a Chinese man to eat a banana. It doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, which is so what I'm saying. Need, Find the market focus. first. Well, let me say that we know that the rather marketing officers and the SDC people, they do understand what the market and approach should be like. But when you come to a Jumbo who must get into the space, and there was a Jumbo name on this paper here. But when you come to a Jumbo who must get into the space, they are nowhere to be found. Do we have any further recommendations? For the sector, yes, Virgin. Very, very quick recommendation. As I was explaining, in our parish, we have a lead office. And what we have found is that there are young persons with business ideas and putting out products as well. As you will notice when you go outside, you will see the sauce is being created. For instance, that young man is creating a sauce from turmeric, and turmeric is such a powerful agent against cancer and so forth. Uh, you will see another young man making baby clothing and so forth. We have persons who are doing other things, baking, and a whole host of, of, of activities. Now these are young people, and they are around us. They are in every nook and cranny of our community. Now the point I'm making is that at the corporation, we have a program in place, yes, that we can capture and assist a few, but the important thing is to be able to create the linkages to pass them on to someone else for instance, one of our young partners, participants, 
is now going to be assisted by FHI 360 mm -hmm. in, in, in developing its yeah. product further. And we are taking him through the stages with Bureau of Standard so that he can fully be certified and go there. So the idea is that we make use of networking because you're right, resources are around, but sometimes some of us have to be conductors who can channel them from one resource area to the other. All right, this is a wrong image from his heart, NJ. through entities like the trust in terms of the fact that you're talking about a business venture sometimes persons start business and the reason why you don't have it the sustainability is because when they are losing traction they don't know where to go to see if they can um, rebuild and sustain and so as the trust we're looking we have, we have done the looking already all we're saying is persons like that we have even been working with credit unions and so on as to where those persons are failing we can give them that closure, gap closure in terms of the um, extra facility, whether it is by funding or otherwise, and in, in terms of training, as to how you sustain your business. A lot of people go into entrepreneurial activities and they are not necessarily business-minded. So they got a little training in the skill, but they did not get the steep training in entrepreneurial, in the whole entrepreneurial entrepreneurship concept. And so sometimes they have to come back. And we find when we strengthen that area, it actually helps the business. And they turn around and actually do better. So that is something I want to encourage that persons, when you're in a business, the business is not doing well, don't just sit there and say it's because whatever is happening. There are other facilities that we have that we can use to assist you. The final comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I'm agreed, my sister, right here. Let me tell you something. The persons who start DNG never get no entrepreneurship training. The people who start Grace Kennedy never get any training. We well, them get the support from government in a number of different ways. So we agree with the training that is crucial. But sometimes the social capital. Yes, and sometimes overtrain and overtrain and overtrain and don't give them the resources that are required to help them to move forward. So the training, I think, is a precondition. But the support is crucial. And just how we quick to support Matalan and all those people and give them an airplane for them company and thing. So I give the people some things to make them work as well. Okay, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your participation. We have noted the, the, the gaps, we have noted the comments. Wow, time is really against time us. Against Mrs. Goldburn wanted to say something in one second, two seconds. Two seconds. The parish interagency network is that entity that brings agencies together so we know what is happening what you what each agency is doing and therefore um, the gentleman who spoke about not having enough information one um, entity or one individual working for an entity not having enough information to go speak with a community that is the space where we have all this discussion going we do not yet have all the agencies on board but we're encouraging because if i if i'm if i'm correct this very um best practice symposium came out of one of our interagency network um meeting so the social development commission you can contact the social development commission or you may contact the, PIOJ, the PIOJ, PIOJ because the for Kingston and St. Andrew, oh. we usually meet at the PIOJ. Okay, thank you so much. Um, let me just hand over to, back to our, our MCs. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, thank you very much for that session on livelihoods. It was a very lively session, you agree? Absolutely. And following on from that, somebody or more than one person remarked about knowing where the opportunities are for funding and so on, so you're being reminded to follow the organizers on their social media platforms for notices of funding and other opportunities, PIOJ, they're all on the front here of the program, PIOJ, JSIF, CSJP, USAID, FH, 
FHI 360 and SDC. Well, we heard about SDC's funding, but the other agencies, you can follow them to find out what kind of funding opportunities and other opportunities that exist that are out there. Okay, so that was very not just thought provoking, but action provoking as well. And now it's time for us to repair to lunch. So, lunch will be served. You're going to exit through the, the front door here and make your way to either of two dining areas. There is the delegate's dining room and there is the garden restaurant. You can take your pick of either of them. You will need to present your lunch ticket. Now, if you didn't register at the front, it means you don't have a lunch ticket. So if you didn't register, please go to the front and register so that you can get your lunch ticket and use it in either the delegates dining or the garden restaurant. Uh, and so you will proceed straight down the, the corridor, exit the conference room, turn right and proceed along the corridor, turn left at the SDC banner and that will take you to the garden restaurant. And then the one just after it is the delegates dining area. Please also visit the booths of all the partners and of course the local employment initiatives, they're all outside. Do visit their booths. You heard a number of persons are here with a lot of you know, initiatives and so on. Stop at the booth and enjoy what they have. And lastly, we reconvene at 2 p.m. So lunch is from one to two. It's about one now, right? Maybe five past. Yeah, who cares about the five minutes, right? Just come back at two o'clock and we'll continue with the session after that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. See you at two.